position, I suppose. Yeah, I'm Tony Giddens. I'm a member of the House of Lords in the UK. I'm an academic with strong connections to Cambridge and the LSE and work directly in politics to some degree as well. Um, first thing I want to ask you about, yesterday uh, someone made the point that the liberal left, uh, liberal democrats haven't done a good enough job of defending democratic values and really explaining to people what, uh, well I guess my question is, do you think there is a need to articulate a new vision for a new social contract, a new uh, kind of inclusive society. Um, well, I'll start with your first point because, you know, there's a difference between social liberalism and social democracy. Social liberalism is a more of an American term and the left are called liberals. In Europe and elsewhere, that means something different. So let's assume we're talking about social democracy, that is, liberal left of centre parties. They made a big impact on the world. 20 years ago when there were many such governments. They made a lot of positive changes and Tony Blair and Bill Clinton, in spite of their mishaps, you know, they did make significant reforms. Some of those reforms are being made everywhere today. For example, you must reform labour markets. You must do in a much more flexible labour market system. And I'm not sure it's completely fair to blame them for the global economic crisis because a, first of all, nation states can't manage that. That is the job of the transnational institutions. And second, you always say in retrospect, but if anyone would be to blame, it was the economists who didn't anticipate it. I mean, no single prominent economist anticipated the timing and nature of the economic crisis. And although it's only one of the factors, the global economic crisis is still shaking the world up, especially the industrialized countries, because, for example, levels of income for lower level workers have fallen since then, and welfare states are under strain, and it's not fully resolved. So that's certainly an important part of the kind of dislocation, yes, but it will be a mistake to suppose that's the only thing. So given that that dislocation has happened, where do we go next? How do we respond to that crisis and the kind of disinfectation people are dealing with? Uh, well, I think we would have to analyse the sources of the dislocation a bit more because you're not dealing just with the aftermath of the economic crisis. You're dealing with what that reflect, reflects. The first globalised economy ever, which simply is not controlled adequately globally. We're still struggling with that. Easily the most integrated world ever. You know, I really disappoint agree with people who say that globalization is going into reverse. Global, it may be if that just means economic integration, and that may not be a bad thing, but if it means interconnection, which for me it has always meant actually, this is you know, a hyper interconnected world. What we're doing now could be seen immediately by someone in a remote rural area in China or anywhere in Africa. This is really a world awash with change in which I think what we're doing now, because most of this is digital, um, photography is digital, um, it reflects the, the sort of broad effects of the digital revolution. And one of the things one shouldn't do is just identify it with social media. It's very important, but the changes are structural. For example, in labor markets that I just mentioned, but also in politics, because obviously politicians are visible, parliament is visible, in a way it never was before. You've got 24 hour breaking news. You know, what, is, what does that do to people's consciousness? We don't really know because it's too new. What we're doing now is not just reflecting on a situation, we're contributing to it. Yeah. So, do you mind the kind of the causes of this location, they haven't been adequately analyzed? We don't know why it is. Sorry, say that again? Would you say then? That the causes of the kind of dislocation, uh, they haven't been adequately analysed. We don't yet know why people are turning towards populism or turning away from... Oh, I think, I think we know. I don't, don't think you should go straight from these global mm. um, changes directly to populism. That would be a mistake. What you've got is a period of really big dislocation, so socially, economically. Probably the key factors, or two of the key factors, are the ones I've mentioned. 
you know, the rise of the digital revolution and much greater global interconnectedness. But a huge feature of it all is the rise of China. That is transforming the balance of power in the world. We don't know what will happen to an American power, but certainly American global power is no longer unchallenged. China is rivaling the US in most aspects of its influence. It's had this, to me, very positive you know, process. 1.2 billion people raised out of poverty. That is something else. So, I mean, you've got a shifting of the tectonic plates, if you like, which even filters down, to my view, in the era of globalization, to just small things about people. You're probably wearing a shirt made in China. I mean, I, I actually got mine in London, but it wasn't made in London. And very few things that you see and use are made in any single place. So this is, I mean, I describe it as a world which has moved off the edge of history because no one has ever lived in a world like this before, ever, in human history. And it's especially important to note that that relates to populism because if you're a migrant coming from Africa trying to cross the Mediterranean, you've got the same kind of gear as we're operating with, not as high tech as the one I'm looking at now, but um, a lot of migrants have got smartphones. They use them to navigate their passage, the smugglers advertise on the internet. They try and outwit the authorities who try to outwit them digitally. And I think you should remember that, you know, Africa used to be thought by the West as like the dark continent. I think there was a bit of racism in that, but it meant that they were kind of outside the world. Well, once you've got the digital revolution, which has gone to poorer people everywhere, no one is outside the world. And again, that's historically unprecedented. So, I, you know, I, let's say I'm, a, God forbid, a member of ISIS, I lop off somebody's head, then I could put on my mobile phone, I could uh, switch on BBC iPlayer, and I could watch a debate on Islamic State and the House of Lords. What kind of world is that? So, is it surprising that it's pretty dislocated? But I think it's a great mistake just to succumb to pessimism because it's a fantastic mixture. You know, I call it a high-risk, high-opportunity society. The opportunities are just gigantic, as you can see from the case of China, but the risks are also gigantic. And since we don't have much historical experience of them, you can't do like a statistical analysis. So every time you get into a car, I could tell you what the chances of you being in a crash, unfortunately, are. But you just don't know with climate change. You don't know with the global economy. You don't know with the world population rising to 10 million people. But it's important neither to be sort of blithely optimistic nor Spenglerian pessimistic, except it's very dangerous down the ed edges because of the existence of nuclear weapons. Is that it? Well, I think oh, okay. I'll, I'll let you say if there's anything else that we, you haven't mentioned that you think is important to add to this conversation. Okay, fine. Do you want me to write something else? Or? Well, no, just if, you, if there's anything else that you, know, you want to say that we haven't talked about yet. That well, the issue happens. before the conference. Hmm. Do you want me to talk about the conference? Yes, please. Yeah, the issue before the conference is essentially where do we go from, from here in terms of reconstruction? And it's right to say that if you want to call it that, reinventing democracy has to be a key part of it. One mustn't be, however, too naive about this, but there are many interesting experiments in democracy. I think we should look not just at what's going on in the digital world to, to see those, but also what's gone on in other cultures. There's a man called John Keane who wrote, I was going to, oh, can I stop? I was going to say, I was going to mention at the conference. That I'm, there's a man called John Keane who wrote, um, thousand page book on the history of democracy and he says we've got it absolutely wrong democracy did not originate in greece democracy originated in many cultures around the world including islamic ones it will follow that we should look to a range of examples around the world not just think oh this is a digital age we must have a digital democracy i think that's much too simplistic and you must recognize that all forms of direct democracy are dangerous. So you have to be pretty careful with them. Viz, let's say, referendum. You have a referendum in Switzerland, it's all very nice and comfortable and very useful. You have a referendum in the UK in a 
already polarized society is a disaster for the country. Margaret Thatcher was right to say referendums are the instruments of dictators and demagogues. Do you think, though, that through digital technology, there are opportunities to have citizens engage more directly, we're not talking direct democracy and referendums, but to participate more actively, I suppose? Well, through the digital revolution, you clearly have um, possibility of direct participation in many ways which we should in encourage. And we obviously know what some of those are because um, referenda can to some extent even be carried out digitally and there are many things like that. There are many local experiments worth making, you know, citizens, juries can be partly carried online, etc., etc. Except one must not suppose the problems of democracy can simply be solved through democracy. And one must recognize that democracy is vulnerable. And therefore, you have to tread with caution in any direct social experimentation, I think. As I say, it's one thing experimenting in Switzerland. It's another, let's say, experimenting in Hungary, which has got, you know, transformative thing. And as regards populism, I mean, as I say, populism, you know, is a nostalgia. It is, it's linked to sort of huge concerns about migration. But migration, you should remember, is global and we are participating in it as we sit here. I mean, we're elite migrants. We sit here in a very comfortable environment. We expect to get on planes and go all over the world. We don't just necessarily want poorer people to feel they can do the same. So, you know, there are complex issues there which you cannot be too simplistic about.